Python, according to the mystery schools, is the embodiment of every perversity. He is the negative creation, the airman of Zoroasterism. Python, according to the mystery schools, is black magic and sorcery, the black brotherhood. Nephthys, his wife, is the institution through which he manifests. He is neither a single evil nor even a sequence of ills, but an infinite diversity of them, indescribably insidious, empowered to infect the fabric of church and state. Typhon lured Osiris into the Ark of Destruction at the time when the sun enters the house of the scorpion. Hence we know him to be the eternal betrayer, our Judas, that ageless Judas who undoes all good things and inevitably presages ruin. He is the power of the physical universe which is constantly seeking to destroy the spiritual values locked within its substances. Of all good things, Typhon is the opposer, according to the mystery schools, occupying the position of the eternal negative. This evil monster may well be generalized under the appellation of the adversary. In the initiation rites, he is also the tester or the trier. Quote, the Lord who is against us, unquote. According to the mystery religion, he is the personification of ambition, and ambition is the patron of ruin. It was ambition that set Typhon plotting for the throne of Egypt, designing how he should destroy the power of his brother. A learned Jesuit father sees in Typhon Cain and in his brother Osiris Abel. If such a parallel actually exists, then the biblical allegory is susceptible of the same interpretation. Typhon, in their teachings, is the desire of the few pitted against the good of the many. Now, if you understand what I just said, you understand that these are communists, socialists. They believe Typhon is the spirit of dissension and discord that breaks up unity of purpose by setting factions against each other so that great issues lose the name of action. The desire for riches, pomp, power, and, listen to this, folks, sovereignty, by which this evil genius was obsessed, reveals the temptation by which humanity is deflected from its ultimate goal and led into the byways of sorrow and despair. Python, the Queen of Ethiopia, and the 72 conspirators represent the three destructive powers preserved to modern Freemasonry as the murderers of the master builder Hiram Abiff. Now, these three destructive powers preserved to the modern mystery school known as Freemasonry as the murderers of the master builder Hiram Abiff, who was really Jacques de Millet, are ignorance, superstition, and fear what they call the destroyers of all good things. When you get even deeper into their teachings, you find out that ignorance, superstition, and fear stand for the state, the church, and the mob. They believe the advent of greed and perversion marked the end of the Golden Age, the Osirian Age, and with the good prince Osiris, the deeper truth, returned to his own land, he became the victim of a hideous plot. So what is this mysterious chest, so beautiful in its outer appearance, but so fatal in its application? Well, folks, Plato, who was wise in the wisdom of the Egyptians and who was an initiate of the mystery school, would have answered that it was the body that lures the soul into the sorrows of generation. Now, if this interpretation is projected into the social sphere, the chest becomes symbolic of material organization. Witness the application of this thought to Christianity, where the pomp and glory of the outer show of a vast ecclesiastical mechanism has all but destroyed the simplicity and dignity of the primitive revelation of the mysteries. The murderers rush from the palace with the lead-sealed casket and cast it with its kingly contents 
into the dark waters of the Nile. Thus are the ideals which lead men into the paths of truth and righteousness obscured, and with truth no longer evident, according to them, error, which is the Christian church, can rule supreme. Typhon, by now you should know that Typhon is their designation for Christianity. Typhon ascended the throne as regent of the world, swinishly gloating over a dejected humanity he had led into dark and devious byways. By the Nile, may we not understand the river of generation, in the current of which souls imprisoned in mortal nature move helplessly upon the never-ceasing current. Now they believe that truth is dead. And according to their belief, with truth dead, or at least exiled to the invisible world, material facts were superseded by opinions. Opinions bred hatreds, and men finally fought and died over notions both senseless and soulless. And that is another deception and another lie. For in my research, I have found that in every instance of the most terrible things and wars that have ever happened on the face of the earth, these men are the ones who have brought it about. Greed became the dominating impulse, they say, gain the all-absorbing end, and ruthlessness the all-sufficient means. In the dark ages of uncertainty when reality hid its face and no man dared to know, the leering typhon ruled his ill-gotten world, binding men to himself by breeding a thousand uncertainties to sap courage and weaken conviction. Men ask, why seek to know? Knowledge does not exist. Life is a cruel jest, purposeless and of short duration. Because the human mind demanded intellectual expression, Typhon sowed the seeds of intellectual confusion so that numerous orders of learning appeared which were convincingly plausible but untrue. These various orders of thought survived by catering to the weaknesses and limitations of the flesh. Today, our great industrial civilization is feeling the heavy hand of an outraged destiny. The evil genius of our ambitions has again undone us and our follies crumble about us. Typhon rules the world, for the earth today is the arena of the ambitious. Remember, Typhon is their symbol for Christianity. If Typhon, as Plutarch has suggested in one of his manifestations, represents the sea, then it appears that this second destruction of Osiris may refer to the Atlantean deluge. And the story continues. The body of Osiris, the secret doctrine, is divided into 14 parts. Remember, Osiris was chopped into 14 parts. They found all save one, the phallus or the penis of Osiris. Well, the body of Osiris represents the secret doctrine. It's divided into 14 parts and divided among the parts of the world. And the lost word of Freemasonry is the generative force, the lost part of Osiris, the lost part, the secret of the secret doctrine. So we must therefore understand that it was scattered through the seven divine and seven infernal spheres, the locusts and tails of India, or by different symbolism, to the seven worlds which are without and the seven worlds which are within, the Kabbalah of the Jews. Bacchus was torn into seven pieces by the Titans and Osiris into fourteen pieces. To use the words of Faber, quote, both these stories are in substance the same, for the second number is merely the reduplicate of the first. By a variation of much the same nature, the ancient mythologist added seven titanides and seven kabiri to the seven titans, unquote. The parts of Osiris were now scattered so hopelessly that ambitious Typhon, or the titans, felt his authority to be secure at last. But wisdom is not thus easily to be cheated. Listen to this carefully, folks. This is their own words. In the dark retreats of Islam, the Sufi explored the depths of nature. Among the Jews, the learned rabbins unraveled the intricate skine of Kabbalism. Among the Greeks, initiates rose to life through the nocturnal rituals, rituals of Eleusis. In India, neophytes were brought to the contemplation of the triple-headed Brahma at Elephanta and Ellora. 
Through the Middle Ages, the alchemists in their retreats explored the infinite chemistry of existence. The Illuminati sought the pearl of great price, and Rosicrucian adepts sought to recast the molten sea. In the Egyptian rites, Horus is the savior avenger, son of Isis, conceived by magic or the ritual after the brutal murder of Osiris. Hence, he is the posthumous redeemer. Freemasons are Hori. They are the eye of Osiris, whose body, therefore, is made up of eyes. Each initiate is a Horus. Each is a hawk of the sun, spelled S-U-N, and for one reason is each raised, and that is that he may join the army, which is to avenge the destruction of wisdom and restore the reign of the all-seeing Lord, Lucifer. Each one is dedicated to the overthrowing of the reign of Christianity. The great battle in which the sons of the hawk rout the hosts of darkness is the mysterious Armageddon of Revelation. They believe that the Armageddon of Revelation is the Kurukshetra of the Mahabharata, and the Ragnarok of the Eddas. In this battle, the hosts of the adversary shall be routed forever. The great purposes of the Osirian rite are thus revealed in an unsuspected clarity. The Hershesti are philosophically opposed to the reign of ambition. It is their duty to reestablish that golden age when wisdom personified as Osiris and not selfishness personified by Typhon shall dictate the whole course of human procedure. The day must ultimately come when the Horai, by virtue of their royal purpose, uh, accomplish the consummation of the great work. The great work, folks, is the elevation of man to the illumined man, or 666, and the establishment of a one-world totalitarian socialist utopia on earth. The missing word will be found, and the golden substitute will be replaced as promised in the ancient rite. Osiris will rise in splendor from the dead and rule the world through those sages and philosophers in whom wisdom has, been, has become incarnate.